All right, today I'm going to do a twofer. I'm going to review both the new JBL Stage 2 280F floor standing, which features two 8-inch woofers and then their HDI high-definition imaging waveguide with, I believe it's a 1-inch dome tweeter. Let me check. Yes, okay. It's a 1-inch dome tweeter aluminum, and it is a 2.5-way design. I'm also going to be reviewing their 2-way design, the JBL Stage 2 250B. It's a bookshelf. This one features a five and a quarter inch midwoofer and then the same tweeter waveguide combination, although I'm sure it's a different crossover point, I would hope. Now, to be honest with you, I was really personally intrigued by these. When I saw that they were coming out with these, they being JBL, and the price they were targeting, I thought, man, that would make a killer home theater setup on the relatively cheap. We're not talking Sony cheap, where they were about, what, 150 bucks for the floor standing speaker? Not that cheap. But for about $1,100, $1,200 a pair, you can get the 8-inch floor standards. And then for about $400 per pair, you can get these 250B bookshelf speakers. And I think that's probably right in that sweet spot of a beginner coming into this hobby or somebody who maybe just doesn't want to invest a lot of money. I'm going to go ahead and save you a lot of time up front by just telling you flat out, I'm kind of disappointed. I really had hoped for more. Now, the good side about these speakers is that they have low compression and low distortion with respect to their size. And in fact, the 8-inch floor standard speakers, I keep calling them 8-inch, the ones that feature the dual 8s, are pretty dang impressive in terms of output capability. But both of these speakers lack in terms of linearity. So if you're expecting to fire these up, and maybe you're a two-channel purist and you're trying to get into something that's going to sound pretty awesome, but you don't want to use any equalization, these aren't for you. In fact, what I would point you to would probably be something like the Polk R500, which are roughly the same price as the tower speakers. They don't have as high output levels, but they're more linear and they sound better natively, just on their own. And then alternatively, the Polk R200 bookshelf or R100 bookshelf speakers. I think those are good alternatives for the stereo enthusiast, or the purist, if you will. But if you're looking for maybe a home theater setup on a budget and you're going to be using equalization, then that kind of changes the role of, of this review. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide you with my subjective impressions. It's going to be kind of quick. I'm also going to provide you with some data, and, and that may be a little bit more limited because I'm reviewing two speakers at the same time here. But I don't really see the point in breaking this review up into two separate reviews. It just it doesn't really make any sense because there are so many similarities between these two speakers. So first up for the floor standard speaker, the thing that I noticed the most Okay, so I always review speakers. I get them in, I listen to them, and then I test them. And I know that that may sound quirky to some, and then other people may think that that makes perfect sense. To me, it makes perfect sense because I don't want to be biased by the data that I'm going to see. If I see the data, then I'm looking for certain things. Most of the time, and I would say probably like 80% of the time, if I'm pulling a number out of my ass, I would say that the data pretty well aligns with what I hear. And it's pretty easy for me to get an idea of what the data is going to show me when I'm listening. I take my, I'm listening to different tracks. I'm taking my notes and does the bass sound this way? Do I hear sibilance? Do I hear too much forwardness in the vocals? Is there a recess in the vocals? Is there not enough snap, attack, or decay? Does it sound hollow? Does it sound boxy? Those are kind of attributes that I'm looking for. And depending on those attributes, I can kind of designate a series or a range of frequencies. Hey, if it's going to sound maybe hollow, it's going to be maybe 500 to 1 kilohertz, somewhere in there, look in that area for the data to see what you find. And I'm talking to myself, of course. And then when I look at the data, if I don't see something in that region, I go, huh, okay, what else could it be? And then I go on the hunt, trying to understand it. That really is the purpose of this channel is to not just provide you with data, not just to provide you with a subjective opinion, but to link those two up together so it makes more sense for you. And that way, when you watch future reviews, it makes a little bit more sense to you each time. And then ultimately, at some point, you can get to the point where you can look at data and you can say, I have a pretty good idea of how the speaker is most likely going to sound based on all of this data, not just one graphic, but all of the data that I'm giving you. And then you can make informed purchase decisions based on that rather than just data or just an opinion. Okay, so now that I've set that stage, no pun intended, Actually, it kind of was intended. I thought about it right before I said it. Okay, now that I've said that, when I fired the floor standing speakers up and sat down, something was off. I could not figure out exactly what it was, and it was it was kind of bothering me. 
So I pulled up my WIM Ultra, which is on loan to me for review right now, and it has an app-based equalization. So I'm pulling up the equalization, and at first I thought it sounds a little bit lifeless. Maybe it's 200 to 300 hertz. You know, maybe maybe I need to bring that up. So I did that, and it kind of sounded like it fixed it, but didn't quite. So then I thought, okay, well, maybe I'm off. Maybe it's like 600 to 800. So I'll bring that up with EQ, and I'm bringing it up like three, four, five decibels. It's a pretty big jump because I want to see if there's a difference. And I certainly noticed a difference, but it didn't seem to fix what I was trying to target. Ultimately, I just left it as a head scratcher. I went and tested it. Then I looked at the data. And in the data, what I saw was there is a mild dip or, or a dip around the lower mid-range area. So that kind of made sense why that sounded a little bit better. But what I noticed and what wound up being the real big issue for me was that above about like 10 to 12K, the response falls off like a rock. I mean, just, just falls off. With that in mind, I took the speaker back down off my clipple test stand. I brought it back inside. I listened to both of them. I listened to a stereo pair. And I used the app in the whim, brought 20K up, right? So when I do that, I set a cue of about 0.5, big wide filter, bring 10 to 20K up. And then when I did that, I was like, oh, that's what I was missing. It's been so long since I've had to do that to a speaker that I didn't even think that that would be the problem. And that just goes to show you that's why it's important to have not just the data, and not just an opinion, but you got to have both. You got to marry them up because otherwise you're not getting the full story. Okay, so the same thing can be said for the 250B bookshelf speaker, but they don't quite sound the same. The 250B bookshelf speaker doesn't have that lower mid-range dip that sounds a little bit uh, like it's lacking in vocal character, if you will, if, if that's a, a good way to describe it. Whereas the floor standard speaker does. It's just, it's, it's kind of missing. It's a little bit more soft. It's kind of missing that bottom vocal register for both male and female voices. The other thing that I noticed about the 250B was that it sounded a bit sibilant and it sounded more sibilant than the data would indicate. And when I looked at the data, I was a little bit thrown off by it, but I, I think I have a pretty good understanding of why that is. And I'm gonna explain that to you. Now you could hear this speaker, the 250B as sibilant, or you could hear it as not forward, maybe recessed, lack of attack, lack of dynamicism. But again, I'm gonna to explain to you why I say that shortly. Both of these speakers have a radiation width that's about plus or minus 50 to plus or minus 60 degrees, kind of depending on where you wanna draw that line, so to speak. Personally, I like a wide radiation of around about plus or minus 60 degrees. If I go wider than that out of a speaker, it gets to the point where it sounds like the image is too diffuse because there's just too many reflections in my room. If it's more narrow than that, it's say like plus or minus 30, like some horn speakers maybe. And these are technically horn slash waveguided speakers, but I'm talking about specifically like Klipsch. Klipsch designs are like 30 to 40 degrees in radiation. So there's a lot more narrow. When I hear something more narrow, it just doesn't have that sense of space in terms of the sound stage. It's not like, oh man, that's way out here. That's way out there. It's just kind of compact and really narrow. Now that would work well if you have a very reflective room or maybe you just like that kind of sound, more of a hard line stringent sound where you don't have a lot of play room or wiggle room, if you will. In, in terms of soundstage, imaging, cueing, and things like that. I like where these speakers are at in terms of the radiation for the most part. However, there are some areas where they could use improvement. They're a little bit wider in certain areas than others due to diffraction. You're gonna see some of that in the data shortly as well. Now, as I said earlier, the plus side of these speakers is they do well in terms of distortion and compression, but mainly that falls on the floor standard version with the dual eights. And you can imagine why, it's got two eights, so most likely it's gonna have more dynamic headroom in that regard, especially in the bass. The bookshelf speaker is relatively small and it doesn't do as well in terms of compression and distortion, but for its size, I think it's kind of on par with most of the others that I reviewed thus far. Having mentioned Klipsch, let me go back to that for one second. You can look at the Klipsch RP8000F2 or the Klipsch RP6000F2. Both of these are somewhat similar in price, although they're about $100 to $300 more, depending on which model you're looking at. Both clips do better in terms of directivity, which means they will take better to equalization. However, both those clips are also more narrow. Both those clips natively are much brighter as well. So you'll need to use EQ if you want a more balanced sound. However, the JBL extends about 20 Hertz lower than both of those clips. So it's not like you're gonna say, well, this one is definitely better than the other one. As always, it's gonna depend.
going to depend on what you're after and what you're looking for. So let's move on to the data. And first of all, we're going to talk about the 280F floor standard. All the data that you're about to see was captured using my Clipple near field scanner, which gives me anechoic data in a non anechoic environment. So we know what the speaker is doing before we put it into a room. And that way I could better make suggestions for what you should do. Impedance of the 280F, a couple resonances here that really just those stand out in listening, okay? And you're not really gonna be able to do much about this particular one because it's followed by a sharp dip. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. All right, 1K, resonance, sharp dip. With standard equalization, there's no way that you can really target these specifically unless you use a very super, super narrow equalization filter, like a Q of probably six for the 900 Hertz and maybe about maybe 15 for the 1.1 kilohertz, but they're so close together. When I try to do that, it just didn't sound right. So I just kind of gave up. What I wound up doing was I boosted this lower end a little bit by like one and a half decibels. And then I actually took my EQ and I boosted this down here up and it actually did help. It brought out more air and more of liveliness, I guess, to the overall sound. Maybe that is cited bias. I'm just being honest with you. I don't know, but it seemed like it worked to me. Another thing worth pointing out is the higher sensitivity, 89.5 decibel sensitivity. That's pretty good. And it's low impedance, so it should be pretty easy to drive. Overall linearity isn't terrible, but I've definitely seen better for sure. F3, 48 hertz, F10, 30 hertz. So the speaker gets down to at least 50 hertz in room, maybe a little bit below that, but you still might want to use a subwoofer if you're trying to cover home theater duty. CEA 2034 data set, here we go. Uh, overall, you know, it looks like you could probably equalize some of these issues but you're gonna have a little bit of trouble. The fact that these all follow each other pretty well means that the horizontal dispersion is gonna be all right. So most of these issues that you're seeing down here, these squigglies and this kind of jump right here, that's due to the vertical separation and maybe some diffraction elements as well. Estimated in-room response and how I heard the speaker without EQ. In-room extension to about 50 Hertz. Lack of air and space best used with EQ, especially at pointed off axis. See this? That's what I heard. So when I brought this up with EQ, that really helped. It wasn't just above 12K, but it's also this right here. If you fire these up and listen to them in your listening room, don't be surprised at all if you find like something is missing and it's not the standard stuff. Grab your EQ, boost above about maybe even 8K and see what happens. I'm not saying run it like that indefinitely, but see if it makes a difference to you because that was the difference maker for me. Horizontal at about plus or minus 55, Vertical 15 to 20 degrees relative to the tweeter axis. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels and then at 96 decibels. And you see this peaking right here. Most people might be inclined to think that that's tweeter distortion, but I don't think that it is. The specified crossover is two of them. It's 1.1K and 2.1K. So the 1.1K would be the bottom woofer to the top woofer. And then the 2.1 would be the bottom or the top woofer, I should say, to the tweeter. And that would be right around here. This right here, also aligns with that resonance that we saw in the impedance data. Multi-tone distortion full band, you can see it peaking up above about, uh, maybe this is 2K or so. You can see from about maybe 600 Hertz to about, I don't know, 2.5K that there is increased distortion. Now I believe that this increased distortion is again, probably due to that mid woofer, that mid range and less likely due to the tweeter because the high frequency is lower overall. What happens if you use an 80 Hertz crossover filter? Ah, eh, not a whole lot. Compression. All right, this actually looks pretty good. You do have some compression around 2.1, so maybe a little bit of limiting on that tweeter. And I say limiting, I'm just talking about in terms of output capability. There's a little bit less on that tweeter. But overall, to me, this looks pretty dang good. Now let's move on to the bookshelf speaker. About 86 decibels sensitivity, but you can see that the frequency response is more, it's, it's a little bit more all over the place, right? So you've got a dip around one to 2K, uh, comes back up and then dips around about 4K. So this is diffraction, and this is not likely diffraction. F3 at 64, F10 at 50 Hertz. These speakers aren't gonna get low. You'll wanna use a subwoofer for these if you plan to buy these to use as your mains. CEA 2034 data set. Notice this dip is consistent. That means that you're gonna be able to equalize that dip up if you want to, or you can equalize this right here down. That's important because estimated interim response. This dip right here, it sounds like there's a lack of attack, lack of detail, lack of clarity due to this dip right here. But then it also is rebounded by about two to three to four K. So that's gonna kind of come off as potentially, potentially sibilant, maybe not entirely sibilant, but also maybe a bit forward. So it's gonna sound recessed and then forward. And that's the part that I didn't like about this particular speaker is that it was 
it was kind of hard to gauge what sounded good and what didn't. And then you compare that to the high frequency just dropping again, like the bigger brother does, the floor standard, above about, what is this, six, seven K? So that creates another issue in terms of lack of air, or lack of space. And this is where I would add equalization here. But as I said previously, you could technically add equalization to bring this up and you could add equalization to bring this down. So that's what makes these speakers worthy of EQ. Multi-tone distortion though shows us something that's a little bit more scary. So at the highest output of about 96 decibels, we have well over 3% distortion. And this being down at like negative 15 or so, I don't know what that value is. If you wanna look it up, you can, but it's definitely over 3%. I think we're 10% at negative 20. So it's pretty high. What about compression? Okay, well, this is kind of what I expect, especially on the low end. It's just kind of giving up. On the lower end, it's just like, yo, the port, I'm not acting right with the chamber, things are going crazy, and I'm starting to give out output. And the mid-range, upper mid-range tweeter area. So the tweeter area actually looks all right. So the tweeter is doing well with this particular speaker. It just seems like the mid-range mid-woofer is the one that's giving up sooner. All in all, I'm kind of meh on these speakers. Like there's not a lot to excite me, but the floor standard does well at higher output volume. So if you wanna use these for home theater, grab your equalizer, enjoy them, have fun, with the bookshelf, I'm even less enthusiastic. And to be honest, I just feel like, I feel like these should have been better. With the JBL name, I'm looking for a more linear response. Now, maybe that's not what they're going for anymore. And that's fine. But personally speaking, in my opinion, I wanted something more that these speakers couldn't deliver. And that pretty much does it for me. So, hope you appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed watching this video. Hope you learned something. If you have any questions, give me a comment below like, thumbs up, all that cool stuff. If you want to help support this channel and what I'm doing here, you can do so one of a few different ways. You can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner, where you can support me that way and get behind the scenes information and early access, things of that nature. Alternatively, if you're planning on buying anything from Amazon or Crutchfield or Best Buy or Target or Newegg today, tomorrow, next month, make sure you remember to come back to my page, go to my description, click the generic affiliate link that I use, and then type in whatever it is that you want to buy and buy it through that generic affiliate link. That way you're not paying anything out of pocket, but you are helping this channel by earning me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And I truly appreciate that because ultimately that's how I keep the lights on. That's how I'm able to do extra fun things when I wanna take a break from all of this. I appreciate you all watching. I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Double deuces again. Peace.